Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Daily Podcast. We got a special one for you here today. We're going to talk about the Schaefer Cox story. I'm Hody Johns, your horse. Your, uh, your horse. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am joined by Jordan Page and Angela Clemens. Jordan, how are you? Doing great, buddy. How awesome. are you? No, do, uh, great. Uh, great to meet you. Uh, you have been all over the liberty movement, but we'll, uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, Angela, how are you? Good. Good. Thank you for having us. Oh, no problem at all. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing the world a service. So let's dig right into it. Um, I guess we'll start, Jordan, with you. Just give me a little bit about, we'll say Schaefer Cox before the incident. Describe who he was, the type of th beliefs he had, what, his activism, whatever you can think of. Honestly, Hody, Schaefer was like a, a young Ron Paul. You know, he had the same sort of uh, charisma and just insp inspirational quality that, that drew people to Ron Paul. And he was drawing huge crowds everywhere he went. Um, he, he, was, he was holding, you know, public meetings, teaching people about the Constitution, about their rights. Um, you know, setting up communication networks, citizen networks to protect people from, from you know, the, the, the tyranny of our, of our standing army, which also known as cops. Uh, he was just amazing a person, still is an amazing person, but he, he was like a rising star. I mean, he was in his early mid-20s, and he was the Alaskan delegate to the Continental Congress in 2009. And, you know, ev everyone who worked with him or met him uh, back then that I know all describe him as just a powerhouse brilliant young man who who had a bright future and what and, and was going to go on to do great things he was running for office uh, he got I think 30 38 percent of the vote on his first uh, on his first try running for office um, just an, just an amazing guy and very very brave not not afraid at all to take on hard subjects and to take principled stands and and he was becoming extremely popular and he was during it during the course of his of his uh, work running for office and meeting all the constituents in, in Alaska that he was uh, hoping to, to get their vote he learned about a lot of corruption uh, in, in, in government concerning child trafficking and drug trafficking and I'll let Angela uh, speak more in depth on that but the, but ultimately the uh, the state came down on him uh, extremely hard and uh, to, to protect that secret so but just an amazing guy to total Liberty guy Ron Paul Liberty guy and uh, you know an exa certainly an example for other people to follow yeah Angela I'm gonna give you one more ball to juggle while you're talking about some of what he uncovered there's the there's the trafficking uh, obviously he's against the establishment and then I think the beginning of his legal woes was the establishment of a, a I guess how would you describe it? A personal, private militia, a peacemaker's militia, uh, public, but private. I, I'm not sure how to describe it. Maybe you can do better because you're the legal mind. Well, well, you were cutting out a little bit, but like Jordan was saying, the re you know, everyone asks, why was he targeted? And the main reason he was targeted was because he was exposing child, tra child sex trafficking and drug trafficking. So that was the main thing. And then uh, he was such a great speaker that he had a lot of great ideas of people willing to stand together to um, to film, film corruption when it was occurring. He created what's called the Liberty Bell system where you could call, um, if someone was caught by an authority, you could call a number of people and people would show up with their phones to kind of keep that in check. So yeah. um, that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, whenever you uh, you create a system that holds the authorities accountable, uh, the authorities tend to not like you, and uh, and very much so with Jordan Co or with uh, Schaefer Cox, he was he created more than just that one system. There was there was, and I think the part that I cut out on maybe was the peacemakers militia, twenty five hundred strong, and that was what from what I understood the beginning of his troubles was. He said. Uh, that they were at his command, and then things kind of spiraled from there. What was the goal of the Peacemakers Militia? Well, the goal of the 3,500-man militia is what I understand it, and the goal was peace. The goal is peace. Always uh, Schaefer's goal is peace. Um, 
like you said, they, the authorities didn't like it. So they sent in two FBI informants to, and their, their goal was to try to get Schaefer to be provoked to violence. So for two years, they tried through several means. They threatened his life. They threatened to take his child away. Um, at one point, his family was held um, kidnapped in a, one of the informant's attics for 21 days and the attorney went on record saying that that 21 days meets the legal definition of kidnapping uh, but during the two years when they were trying to provoke and trap him with some kind of violent statements he kept repeating over and over um i'm not going to shoot it out i'm not going to shoot it out if they come for me i'm going to pull a gandhi not a rambo he just repeated that and all of that evidence was withheld from the jury during his federal trial and just to back up a, a little bit is his um, during, so after the two years and they uh, planned to murder him, the government um, conspired and solicited other people to murder Schaefer Cox on March 10th, 2011. Um, they, the informant J.R. Olson was told to, the FBI gave him an unmarked gun. Oh, I, I think we might've lost Angela there. Oh. Angela, okay. sorry, we lost okay. you. You're back. You're okay. okay. Um, so we, we got to the unmarked gun. Yeah, they they told uh, the informant to throw that in the lap of Schaefer Cox so that they would have a reason to kill him. Um, mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so so let's let's break these down piece by piece here because I find that there's so much to that it is in this case that we've seen in other cases. This is just kind of a culmination of all of those things. Um, I guess Jordan, we'll we'll. I'm sure you're qualified to talk about this a little bit. The classic FBI foils FBI terror plot is here uh, in a big way. The informants, the two informants uh, acted like they were his friends. We're like, oh, I'll hide you, I'll house you. And to, uh, right up to the point where they're stealing the battery on his car. And then they're like, hey, let's kill some authorities, man. Let's do it. And he kept saying, no, no, no. And they just kept trying to get him to say Yes, and he never did it, but they were they really wanted this. I mean, it's like a bait car, it's entrapment, it's it's just uh I, I, I mean I'm sure you have talked about this often uh with with the police and militia doing illegal things. Uh what are some thoughts that you have or something that I didn't cover on that? Well, something that's important to to, to note, Odie, is that his original trial was a state trial. It was an Alaska state case and it was thrown out. It wasn't that he was found guilty or not guilty. It was thrown out for lack of evidence because they played all the tapes in court and there was no evidence to even try the case. And so while he was still incarcerated, the feds came in and superseded their jurisdiction and tried him illegally. And, and, they, and the prosecution withheld that withheld over 500 pages of evidence and the judge in that case, because they couldn't find a federal judge to even listen to this garbage. So they brought one out of retirement to, to, to try the case. And he refused to allow those tapes to be even played. So the jury in the federal case never even heard the tapes that had gotten the first case thrown out. So there was, all, there was a mountain of exculpatory evidence that proved his innocence that was denied to, be, to even be, to be heard by the jury in the federal case the federal case itself was unlawful because the federal government doesn't have the jurisdiction to try someone for the crimes that they allege that he, that he, that he committed. Whenever they don't have anything to charge you with, they charge you with conspiracy. Okay? His solicitation charge was dropped in August of 2017. So now, now the judge in this case, Hody, last month in February, ordered that all that evidence that the, ju that, that the jury was not allowed to, to, to hear or see, he, he ordered that all that evidence be released. So Schaefer has a resentencing coming up, and our hope is that that, that evidence will, will be brought to light by then, and it will negate the, the, the remaining conspiracy charge, because without a solicitation, there is no conspiracy. You can't have a conspiracy without solicitation, and the solicitation charge is gone. The only other charge he has is a weapons charge, and that charge, I believe, the penalty for which, and, and that's a whole separate issue. He's still innocent of that. But that charge, I think, I believe the sentencing for that is up in like September. 
So th th this, is a, this is a real situation where this guy was completely railroaded by the authorities. The, the system, the injustice system was weaponized against him, and he was, char he was charged with complete nonsense charges that carried a, he a heavy penalty, and they've you know, locked him in like the worst dungeon in the world and thrown away the key. But now this judge's order to release the evidence has come up. This is a huge ray of hope, and this is why we're doing what we're doing now with the song that I've written for Schaefer, the music video we've put out, and this campaign to get people to donate to, to his legal fund at freeshafer.com. That's like where we want to send people, this freeshafer.com. And they can learn everything that we're talking about. They can learn it there. There's documentaries there. The music video's there. There's links to buy the song. Um, half the proceeds of the song immediately go to the foundation because I use some of Schaefer's lyrics from his book uh, in the song. So he's a co-author of it, and so it, half of it goes directly to the foundation. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about, we're, we are talking about a conspiracy. There was a conspiracy. It just wasn't from Schaefer. It was from the authorities that were trying to cover up what he was exposing. And, and, and they did it with, with the fullest extent of their power. And it, and it was just an absolute nightmare for him and his family. Yeah, I, I am not one to put on my tinfoil hat easily. I do not tend to believe in conspiracy theories. I tend to think they try to find something they try to make something out of nothing. In this case, it's funny that the prosecutors, or I'm sorry, that the courts couldn't hear the tapes because I, as an internet viewer, can hear the tapes. We have them played. We hear the informants talking about doing the thing with the unmarked gun, holding, uh, what, the other informant holding up a knife to his friend, saying he'll slit his throat if they don't start killing officers of the law. Just, just, it's one of those where it's like, how am I, as a person, allowed to know this information and yet the courts aren't? Uh, Angela, I'm going to toss this your way because you're the legal mind here. Uh, from what I understand, the prosecutors weren't exactly as clean as the driven, as the driven snow either, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, at, at, the, time, at the time of this trial, um, they, you know, they were being coached to keep things quiet. Um, and since since that time obviously being keeping it quiet didn't work um for schaefer so a lot of the supporters uh, several of us have the entire uh discovery evidence over three over two terabytes of data and we can we can show it to the public um rudy davis has over 700 videos he's made about schaefer cox and the discovery evidence yeah the prosecutors were already in hot water with the Senate uh, mm -hmm. for a different right. case where they had, right. uh, l let's see here, they, they pulled the Kamala Harris. They uh -huh. withheld evidence from the defense. And then, uh, let's see here, what was the other one? They, they, with Ted, uh, Sen Senator Ted Stevens? Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Yeah, so they, w they right. withheld they, evidence. They did a... Coerced the testimony, I think. Sorry, I think we might have lost you again. But the, the yeah, the the prosecutors were already known to get a conviction however they could and do some illicit things to get there. And then, of course, they put that prosecutor and their co cohorts in charge of this because they needed somebody. Frankly, they needed somebody to do something illegal because they weren't going to get a conviction if they did everything by the law. Um, Correct. That's yeah. correct. Right. Yeah. Even even the prosecutors knew he was innocent. That's why they had to hide hide the truth. Sure. And, and there's legitimate reasons to suppress evidence if it's illegally obtained. But this was legal obtained. In fact, this was insisted like, hey, you need to view this because it matters. And it was suppressed by the courts anyways. Um, so so. So one of the things that I noticed that they do, and this is such an FBI tactic, is to dig through people's dirty laundry. You'll remember when um, that one police officer shot a guy in his own home thinking it was her home. And they were like, well, he did have weed in his home, by the way. That they yeah. rehashed this charge of what they charged him for what battering his wife which his wife even said didn't happen 
they only successfully convicted him on what endangering her. It was just some charge from a long time ago that they decided to rehash and, and basically assassinate his character in the public, uh, which is again, another one of those things. Hey, I shot somebody in their house. I better say they had weed in his house. Cause otherwise this makes me look bad. Oh, we're really going hard after this guy. Well, it might look like he's a nice guy, but 12 years ago, he got tried on a charge that almost stood. I, I, it, it just is mind blowing to me. Jordan, you are kind of the master on knowing every, all the bad things that the government is willing to do to get a conviction. But it really comes to a head in this case, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, there is nothing more protected than the, than the, the, the child sex trade. You know, I mean, I know a lot of people who have investigated this and have received death threats and and ominous visitations from government agencies and it is it's like the one thing you don't take on and Schaefer was taking that on and so they they pulled out all the stops to, to get rid of this guy not the least of which is they moved the trial from Alaska down to Washington during the trial so that so that witnesses for Schaefer could not testify on his behalf uh, and they, they cited uh, convenience, I believe, was the reason why. Yeah, it was convenient for them, certainly not for Schaefer. And once they got this uh, guilty verdict, they, uh, they, the, the judge gave him you know, 26 years. And he was moved to a black site prison, not under the, juris not under the, the, the oversight of Congress, uh, called a communication management unit. They're not. They're called CMUs. Yep. And there's there's two that we know of. One is in Marion, Illinois, and the other's in Terre Haute, Indiana. Schaefer was originally sent to the one in Marion, Illinois. Now these these units are known as like Little Guantanamo Bay yep. units, basically. So when when Guantanamo Bay was supposedly shut down, I don't believe that it was, but when it was supposedly shut down, quite a few of its uh, of its inmates were transferred to these facilities. So it's, it's largely a you know, radical Muslim population, and, and m many of whom are members of ISIS. And he was, he's a Christian, Schaefer's a Christian, and was uh, standing for his faith in this, in this place in Marion, Illinois. A, an attempt was made on his life by one of the Muslim inmates, so they moved him to the other, other place, which was far worse. And... You know, it's, it's widely speculated not, and not without reason that the idea was to get him killed. Um, Schaefer has said in, in uh, several times that there, are, there have been numerous prisoners that have been taken to these units that are non-Muslim that inevitably convert to Islam to avoid persecution and, and murder, um, but he refuses to do that. He's standing on his faith in Christ. And so, you know, th there was a murder that took place at the prison in Terre Haute that he witnessed back in November of 2018, where he and four or five other, other Christian men who are the, 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 the extreme minority in that unit were praying together with a Bible, singing hymns. They were happened upon by, or ambushed, I should say, by a larger uh, force of inmates who uh, seized one of the men, tied his hands behind his back, stabbed him in the heart, and then cut his head off with a wire. And this all happened right in front of Schaefer and these other men. They grabbed another man, stabbed him 12 times. That man miraculously survived. Uh, and then Schaefer and the other men were able to, to put a stop to it as the, uh, as the SWAT team arrived. So the guards did nothing. They hid in a room, in a locked room, to save their own skins and didn't help in any way, shape, or form. And the prison has tried to cover this up. So Schaefer leaked this information and was punished for it by spending 30 days in a pitch black dungeon where he forgot the, the, what, what a human face looked like. So like to, torture is routine in these facilities and, uh, and we're, we're, the things that are going on there need to, need to see the light of day. Uh, it just so happens that a famous prisoner was a witness to it. He was close enough to smell the man's blood. So it's, it's important that people understand what kind of gross human rights abuses are happening in the prison and that there are murders taking place, that people are being martyred for their religious beliefs, and it just so happens that it's Schaefer Cox, and, and all the Christians in this prison are on a hit list. So his life is very much in danger all the time, and you know he needs to be, he needs to be set free, and, this, and the evidence that is gonna be released will hopefully do that. 
Yeah, so Angela, let's talk about that for a second, these CMUs. I am a, I'm an amateur legal mind. I know a good amount. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be a very good lawyer for somebody. But my studies seem to indicate I, I cannot, for the life of me, having done a lot of searching, find any reason, you know, when they create these units, they are to house people of similar crimes. Right now, if he's in prison on, and we'll talk about this in a second, but basically trying to solicit and what silencers and, and devices and stuff like that. Why would you stick him? Th this seems out of pure hate that you just stick him in a prison that deals with radical Muslims. It has nothing to do with trying to acquire illegal like firearm modifications. So, so is there a legal reason since you are smarter than me on this issue, why they would do that? <laughs> well, I think um, the reason that they give is they put a few non-Muslims in this unit um, and they call them, their term for them is balancers. So that way they can tell the public it's for quote terrorists and uh, that's kind of how they justify that. Oh, so he, so he's made to look like a terrorist is the reason they're right. sticking him in there. Oh, right. yeah. okay, yeah. got it. That, that actually is very enlightening. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the one charge that still stands. Well, let's talk about both charges. First, there's the conspiracy to commit murder charge, which was thrown out because it was so bogus. So that's actually a huge success already for the Free Shaver Cox movement because that was, I mean, let's be honest, that's the bulk of it as, as a liberty-loving guy I don't have compassion for somebody that tried to commit murder. He didn't. So now that that's gone, all there is is solicitate, or what, conspiracy to solicit. In fact, attempting to talk about getting a hold of unregistered si silencers, destructive devices, um, unregistered destructive devices, and, yeah, and an unregistered machine gun. Are any of those legitimate? What, it, what, it, what um, how many years are well, those? I went Go ahead. Well, I wanted to say that the, the charge that was dropped is solicitation to murder. And okay. the, all of the weapon charges, he's already served time for those anyway, even though they're not true. Um, but the charge that still stands, that is the longest standing charge, um, follows a conspiracy. Yeah. And I think Jordan was saying this earlier, but you, you can't conspire alone. So you can't, it makes no sense to have conspiracy at all. Um, but the fact that they're, they're finally admitting he did not solicit anyone to help him. So there's no one left to conspire with. So um, that's kind of what we're hoping will be dropped. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I, I had flipped that and I'm, you were right to correct me. It was solicitation to commit murder and conspiracy to acquire these right. these devices that and, makes sense well, no the con the conspiracy to commit murder it was solicitation and conspiracy to commit murder okay those are the two long charges and the other charges are weapon random weapon charges and those are the ones that he's still in jail for right uh, just well he's well he's he, the the weapon charges the mm -hmm. time served on those is almost over so Okay. So that's, that's kind of like, yeah, those, those are the time served is almost over for those. So what we're trying to do is, is hoping to get the conspiracy to commit murder charge dropped. Um, and the Ninth Circuit Court admitted that there are no targets. They even said when they dropped solicitation, they even used the term Mickey Mouse. They said, so can we, can you actually solicit it, uh, someone can you even have a solicitation charge if your target is fictitious like Mickey Mouse? And, you know, most normal people were like, it makes no sense. No, he, it doesn't. There was no identifiable target. Yeah. Right. There that, was no target. There was never a target. That totally makes sense. If I get busted for hiring some guy to kill my wife, people can say, oh, that's your wife. But in this case, they couldn't produce a person in the crosshairs at any point. Got it. No. Okay. And, now we right. are wrong. So the, the whole charge is fabricated. The Got whole it. charge, like Jordan said, they couldn't find anything to charge him with. So they just made one up. They said, oh, just, well, you might do it someday. So here you go. <laughs> that's, all, that's all conspiracy is. It means we think you might do it someday. 
to somebody in the future somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So you know. let's really talk. Let's really talk about the public movement. You two have been huge leaders on this. Um, Jordan, you've got a song out. We're going to play that during the episode, or or perhaps after the episode. But I'll be. You're going to listen to it on this episode. But what's uh, what was your inspiration? Tell me about the movement. You've already had a little bit of success. Um, I guess just describe what it's like to try to get this man freed. Sure, it's a great question. So, you know, I, most of my adult life, I've been writing songs now of, of that, are, that, are, that protest various awful things happening in the world or injustices or standing for really positive movements and positive causes. And I did a lot of work with Ron Paul and was very involved in the campaign. And, and, and so people, people know me as a person who takes on subject matter that's maybe controversial or divisive, but I take, I take a principled stand always. And so I had heard the name Schaefer Cox a number of times over the last five years, but just, I don't know why, man. I don't know why. I never looked into it. I mean, I look into so many things. Maybe I was burnt out. I don't know, but I never did. And then, but I did know his name. I knew he was a prisoner. And last year I was at an event that I was performing at and a guy walked up to me, a guy I know, uh, handed me a book and it was the lost lyrics of Schaefer Cox and it had his face on the cover and I, I looked at it and I just kind of felt the touch of destiny and so I, I read it over the next few days as I was traveling and just was you know blown away I mean what a writer first of all I mean Schaefer is just a brilliant writer brilliant speaker just very inspiring person and yeah I'm a writer also and so like I, I really identified with what he was writing about uh, it, it broke my heart to hear the lyrics about just how this has affected him and his family, the torment of being, uh, you know, unable to provide for them, unable to, to touch them physically, unable to see them and, and what that's done to his life. And so, you know, as a, as a fellow patriot and Christian and father and husband, you know, I, I really identified with this guy. And I have a friend who I knew, it was always posting about him. And so I contacted her to see how, what I could do. We, we talked about me doing a song and she put me in touch with Angela and you know, the rest is history. I wrote the song in December and recorded it in December. And then um, we, we started planning a music video to, to release it on March the 10th, which is the anniversary of Schaefer's unlawful arrest. Um, one thing I'd like to, to know about the book is that he was writing those lyrics in, 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 a, in a former facility before he was moved to the CMU. And it is, it's unclear how those lyrics got out of the prison. They were clearly smuggled out by, because cause they came and got him as he was writing it, as he was sitting there with his papers. They came and got him and took him away, and he thought that these papers were lost forever. Like, oh, he chalked them up to just being thrown away. But somebody found them, and somebody smuggled them out of the prison and got them into, into his team's hands, who published them into a book. That book ended up in my hand last June and has led us to this conversation and, and to the song and to this, into this video. So um, it's, it's, it's making the rounds. It's definitely being suppressed by the algorithms of the, of the tech giants. Um, views on certain videos that we've done interviews for have been taken away. Uh, there's one we know of that at least a thousand views were, were just taken away today. Uh, I've seen this before in my videos. I, I remember when my, when my Liberty music video uh, for my song Liberty got to 50,000 views back in 2011. I was stoked, you know, I was excited. And uh, cause it was the first time one of my videos had reached that many. Yeah. And then the next day it had 47,000 views. So I knew I must've been striking a chord because that stuff doesn't just happen. You know, I'm not imagining it. So, um, so, so the, the algorithm is definitely flagging videos that we're doing and, and so be, because we're making an impact and we're telling the truth and, and there are, there are forces at work that don't want us to tell the truth, but the truth has to be told. The, the truth sets you free and that's what we're doing. Uh, and, and so the song is, has, has been, it's a beautiful song. If I do say so, I think it's one of the best songs I've ever recorded and put out and I'm, you know, very attached to it. And, and I think people seem to be having a great reaction to it and to the video. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times when you put yourself out there online, the trolls come out in full force and just start saying horrible, horrible things in the comments, no matter what it is. And in this case, it's 99.9% .9 support, people lifting Schaefer up in prayer, praising the name of God, and 
and and demanding his release, demanding that the truth be, be come to light. There's so much support for this. It, it blows my mind. I've never seen anything I've ever done have this much support. And uh, so it's it's really encouraging, and we're just going to keep you know pushing forward. Yeah, um, Angela was right to correct me earlier. It's it was the thirty five hundred uh, number in the in the private uh, in, in the militia, and I think people are going to be scared about that because nobody is a risk taker. But I think I have a particular love of it because this is kind of if government has any function much of the time it's to defense. And so for people who are looking for that voluntary society, for more of them, those mutual interactions for saying, you know, this was really the gateway to it to say, Hey, if I got your back, if you got my back, okay. If somebody attacks me, you got my back, I got your back. And this is really a punishment for getting each other's backs. And this is uh, it's a frightening display because that type of thing is something you know, he made it widespread, but theoretically, I can just tell my neighbor, hey, if you guys see people breaking into my house, can, can you have my back? And if I see people breaking into your house, I'll have your back, right? And so it's really scary to think of that being condemned activity, that if anybody besides the government has your back, who, by the way, often doesn't have your back, you know, you're going to be in trouble and we're going to come down on you hard for it. Um, so... <sighs> It's a, it's a tough road. Angela, tell me a little bit about what we need more done legally. I've heard that it is be, it's being, being sent to a lower court for resentencing, but could you tell me, sorry, that's the dog. Can you tell me what exactly, what exactly we need to do or, or what would help you guys to fix all of that? Well, he's got several um, cases pending and they all kind of work together. So he, has ongoing legal costs so that's a big thing and uh, you know freeshafer.com has the links to help out with that um we're also really hoping to find a filmmaker someone who's willing to tell the truth about schaefer cox so um if anybody knows of anybody else ask around and send them all our way so um it is it is going to the lower court but it'll probably be appealed and kind of flip back and forth so, um, sure. but, but either way, he's got ongoing costs with that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, uh, we're going to end this video by, by playing the song, but right before I do that, just tell me, I, I will put them in the show notes, but just for anybody who's listening, that isn't clicking on links, where to go again, whether it's a website song, where do we buy the songs? Uh, where, where's the right place to direct traffic? Where do you want it? Send people to freeshafer.com, first and foremost. Everything's there. The music video's there. Links to buy the song are there. Links to donate to the legal fund are there. His story, documentaries, his, even his letters from prison, which are extremely moving. I re highly recommend people read his letters. They're, in, they're amazing. It's all there. Um, you can get the, the song through iTunes. You can get it through Amazon, Google Play. Uh, CDbaby.com is actually where the foundation will see the most uh, donations from uh, because we keep the most amount of money through CD Baby if you buy it directly through the distributor. Uh, JordanPageMusic.com is my website. You can find the song there as well as all my other music and uh, and videos and whatnot. But uh, but definitely FreeShafer.com is is the go to place. Awesome, Jordan Angela, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this work that you're doing. I know that it is. Uh... I wish I didn't know this, but I know it's dangerous for you just getting involved. And I appreciate you putting your, your, uh, your lives and careers at the stake for doing the right thing. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us this information. Uh, and keep fueling the fires of liberty. Here I am.
Smithereens. 